Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan, and I'm absolutely delighted to have a very amazing colleague who's consented to this interview. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ann Speckart. I'm going to just give you a, a little, a, give our listeners rather, a, a little uh, bio on you first. Uh, Dr. Ann Speckart is director of the International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism and serves as an adjunct associate professor of psychiatry at the Georgetown University School of Medicine. Anne has interviewed over 700 terrorists, their family members and supporters in various parts of the world. She's interviewed over 250 ISIS defectors. She's helped to develop counter-narrative videos interviewing these former ISIS people. More recently, Anne has been interviewing white supremacists, which is of great interest. And Anne is a uh, expert witness. She's an educator. She's also got a uh, clinical psychology background uh, as a mental health professional. And I recently invited her to present at the program in psychiatry at the law, which you, Anne, you did a great presentation for us. Thank you so much. And I want to welcome you to the Influence Continuum podcast. Thank you, Steve. It's an honor to be here with you. So let's let's just start with a little background. How did you get interested in this weird uh, alternative field of study, uh, radicalization? I always, <laughs> I always blame my husband. He dragged me overseas. He's a U.S. ambassador, now retired. Uh -huh. And uh, we were over in Brussels when 9-11 uh, uh, happened. And we were all told to stand down, stay home. And after four or five days, I got stir crazy. So I started volunteering to help. And uh, uh, that was part of it. And then I ended up going to help with Nordost as well, when they took over the theater. And I started interviewing people that were involved in terrorism. And I ended up going through uh, Gaza and West Bank. I had a student that had been in Hebrew University when it was uh, when the cafeteria was blown up. Oh my goodness! And yeah, he had just walked out right, wow. right before, and uh, he was pretty traumatized, and did his PTSD treatment in class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I uh, got interested and started talking to terrorists. And once I started talking to them, I found them so fascinating that I just kept at it. And I think I'm up to around 800 interviews at this point, all of them in-depth psychological interviews. Yeah, it's great. And I really want to do a shout out that you have created counter narrative videos, which was something you and I talked about years ago when we first met each other, the value of former cult members telling their stories to warn people not to get sucked into the group and how they regret it and that there's life after cult. Um, and I believe you told me that you had uh, uh, got some support from Facebook to even put some of these little videos up um, to try to help um, research the effectiveness of yeah, this all of the All of the interviews that we've done in the last five years, I do all the interviewing, but all the interviews over the last five years have been on video, unless mm -hmm. the person flatly refuses to be on video. Mm -hmm. And everyone's been invited to take part in the counter narrative project. If they're not disillusioned, they don't make any sense for that. But if they're disillusioned and sick of whatever group they've been in, then they can say some pretty strong things against the group in the case of ISIS or Al-Shabaab, that it's not Islamic, right. that it's corrupt and overly brutal. In the case of white supremacism, that you just get used and that it destroys your life and you yes. destroy the lives of other people. Yep, it's great. Your work is so important. Um, and I wanna highlight that governments around the world don't have policies that make sense to inoculate people from being recruited into these radical uh, organizations, political, religious cults that are taking over people's lives and creating so much danger and so much trauma for others. 
And in your last presentation for our forensic think tank, you talked about how there are these camps um, in the world with former ISIS people and they're languishing there and no country wants to let their citizens back in if they've been associated with ISIS or very few. And that in many cases, people are getting further radicalized because life is so crappy uh, in some of these camps. So would you take a few minutes and share with our listeners what's happening uh, and what what you think needs to happen to make things better? Well, sure. First to your, your first point about prevention and our governments uh, tend to be slow, so they tend to be on the reactive side and wait till things happen and then they try to put the genie back in the bottle. Right. But prevention is really the name of the game. And that's why we like to use these first person accounts to warn people not to be sucked into ISIS propaganda or Al-Shabaab propaganda or white supremacist propaganda. And we also know that more and more, it used to be said that no one could be radicalized over the internet. But in our ISIS sample of 273, we found 20% were radicalized solely over the internet as far as making their decision to travel to Syria. And 40%, it was hybrid recruitment over the internet and recruitment in person. Mm -hmm. but, as, but as far as the camps, we know that 40,000 uh, people from over 110 countries went to Syria. And many of them went with the idea that they were gonna help the victims of Assad, but they didn't go to join a terrorist group. But once right. they got there, they got shunted into ISIS and some of them became very brutal, uh, disgusting people and um, and others of them really can be seen as victims but all of them the ones that were rounded up and not killed are now in prisons and camps either in Iraq or in uh, northeast Syria if they haven't managed to get home one way or another mm -hmm. the ones in Iraq will stay in rotten prison because Iraq put them through a court process and um basically gave most of them life sentences. Mm -hmm. In Northeast Syria, um, the SDF and the Ains government aren't considered uh, legit governments because it's Assad that is the ruler of Syria. Right. So they haven't put them through court. They're just holding them, most of them without charges. And these are women and little children, mainly. Mm. And uh, most of the kids are under five years old. Oh my God. So when you think of these kids, they're, um, they were brought to or born into ISIS. They have no fault. But the older kids um, end up getting taken away from their parents if they're boys um, and taken to um, prison. So at 12, you will be put in a prison. And when we just recently saw this prison break in Hasaka, Syria, uh, that ISIS orchestrated, the ISIS cadres got a hold of these young boys, there were 700 of them, and threatened to kill them. And they were housed separately, so that's good. But the terrible thing is, uh, you age into worse and worse situations as a boy. So at 12, you get put in prison, um, away from the other prisoners. At 18, the Syrians don't want to release you back out into Syria, right. and the countries aren't taking them home. So you age into prison with the adult population. And in the camps, when they're little kids, there's ISIS women that are still very much affiliated with ISIS that celebrated when this prison break happened, that expect the ISIS guys to come and break them out of camp. Um, they're enforcers, they murder other women, they burn their tents, they harass them. They're very violent. And they have the possibility to try to indoctrinate these young children. Yeah. And as adolescents, these kids are adrift. I mean, you know, they're just among their peers. They don't have good programs. Right. Right. And there's no methodology in place, no policy that America or the UK or U European countries can put um, people who've been captured, but they're not necessarily been spotted killing anybody or doing anything terrorist, but they were involved with uh, ISIS, for example. There's no process to, like, de-radicalize them. There's no educational system. There's no 
checks and balances that can uh, are nobody's thought about it as far as i can tell is that true no it's that there's really strong disagreement about the countries about what to do so syria wants to give them back a northeast syria um i think assad would want them as bargaining chips and god knows what he would do with them but the Kurds that hold these prisoners want to send them back to their home countries, but the home countries are refusing. So the U.S. policy is we bring everybody home mm -hmm. that we consider a citizen and we put them through due process. But we also have really strong anti-terrorism laws so we can prosecute because it's pretty a low bar considered for material support to terrorism. But if you came from Sweden or Norway, there weren't even laws to go and join ISIS until very late in the process. Mm -hmm. And every country is finding it hard to take battlefield evidence, if they can even get a hold of it, to successfully prosecute these people that come back. I was just involved as an expert witness in Norway for a woman who managed to come back with her little kids. And the argument was, as a wife and mother that had gone to live in Syria and then ended in Syria, is she considered an ISIS member and can she be cross prosecuted as a member of a terrorist group? Or is it her husband that was a criminal and she is a wife? And uh, I fall on the side of if you if if they can't show anything that you did that violates your country's laws, um, and you were a homemaker, um, then ha you can't be prosecuted. Right. But it was it's interesting, and some women have been prosecuted just as wives and homemakers that lived in ISIS territory. Mm -hmm. But in all cases, every country has their ideas of how they bring people to justice, if they can get them prosecuted. And it, I, I'm all for prosecution because then you can offer to people, you can go to prison or you can go to this rehabilitation program or both. Right. But if you successfully prosecute, you have something to hold over their head. Right. If you don't, then they can refuse to go through any kind of program. And every country is making their own programs. And then when we go back to Syria, when I first went in and started interviewing, and I've been there, I think, eight times interviewing hundreds of these uh, prisoners, the Ains government of Northeast Syria said, OK, well, you made the detainee rehabilitation program in Iraq for 20,000 detainees. Can you make it for us? And I said, sure, if you if you can get the funds from USDOD or US State Department, sure, I can do that for you. But you've got a bit of a problem here because you have so many different nationalities and different languages that you have to operate in. And um, also, I was expecting that most of these people would go to their home countries. But now fast forward five years, and they're still sitting there with right. nothing. So the local NGOs have made some rehabilitation efforts, and the Kurds have a really interesting way of approaching uh, terrorist prisoners. And their way of approaching is, you're a human being just like me, and we were on the other side of things, but I hope you realize that you were wrong now. And, um, you know, let's, let's figure this out and go forward. And I think the prisoners are kind of amazed by this. Because if they were over in Iraq or if they were held by Assad, they would be victims of torture and they would be badly treated. Right. And they're very crowded um, in the Kurdish prisons because the prisons are just overrun. Mm -hmm. So the conditions are bad, but the human treatment is respectful and decent. Good. Good to know. So it sounds like partially it is a lack of resources financial and a lack of clarity over clear policies that could be put into place to help a lot it's, of people it's differing policies like mm -hmm. the eu has encouraged the member states to take their people home but countries like france sweden they don't want to take them home and they fear them. France has had a prison uh, radicalization problem for years now. And people have come out of French prison that went in for petty crime that got radicalized by someone else that was in for a longer time uh, that came out and did 
pretty heinous lethal terrorist acts. Yep. So they have a, a reason to be concerned and their rehabilitation programs haven't been very successful as well. Right. And that's probably because if you are a Moroccan, an Algerian, a Tunisian uh, of, of these descents living in France, you are living in a different reality. And you, you aren't don't have, treated as a French citizen. In other you words. are not. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so you on. don't have the same opportunities. So mm -hmm. if a rehab program is run, claiming that that is not your reality, <laughs> well, you know, it just kind of it gets laughable then. And um, so that's problematic. And Sweden is less wanting to take people home because they don't think they can prosecute them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's differing, differing aims by differing countries. So for the ones that want to keep their prisoners in Syria, they really need to pony up and put money on the table. And uh, people like me can come in and put programs together. But like you said, there needs to be clarity on are these prisoners going to be spending a long time in northeast Syria? And then what do we do with the children? Because normally children don't go to prison. Right. And um, but then there's all these human rights issues of can you separate mothers and children and mothers that aren't convicted? But normally we do separate mothers from their children when they're in prison. Right. And my belief is we need to act in the best behalf of the children. Yes, me too. Definitely. So um, it seems I've known for decades that prisons are are petri dishes for all kinds of destructive cults to recruit and indoctrinate people into a wide variety of uh, authoritarian belief systems, in, including white supremacy, including uh, ex Islamic terrorists, and including um, Scientology and other types of, you know, more, you know, vanilla or mainstream cults. Uh, but nevertheless, this whole idea of um, the justice system should be just and the justice system should help people rehabilitate uh, and um, rejoin society has just been not, the whole system is out of whack. And I think part of it is in America, at least the paid, you know, prison system is a problem that it incentivizes people and judges to send people away instead of to reform, help them reform and become functioning members of society. I totally agree with you. And um, that's interesting to me. I mean, you're the cult expert that cults also are um, finding people in prison. I, I've been working with this um, jihadist spy that um, was in our federal prisons and working with our FBI and CIA. And it's just so fascinating listening to how these people are so vulnerable. And they came to him and, you know, people that never followed Islam in their life, came to him and said, I want to convert, you know, I want to be part of this big block of prisoners that protects each other. Right. And, but then they, you know, fell right into the um, jihadism, right. the negative jihadism, the militant jihadism. Right. And I can see how they would fall for a cult as well, because they're vulnerable, and no one's offering them what these groups are offering. Yeah, and I, I actually went to a maximum security prison in California. Uh, I actually went with a podcaster named Jordan Harbinger who decided for his 40th birthday he would do a fundraiser for a group that is trying to help people who've been convicted and incarcerated in this maximum security prison and to connect them with a local university and teach them life skills and how to do interviews for jobs. And it was really a, a wonderful experience. But what they said to me is, Steve, gangs are everywhere in prison. You can't survive if you aren't connected mm -hmm. to some of the gangs. And when I, you know, in talking with them about 
you know, for example, my bite model of authoritarian control, B-I-T-E, behavior, information, thoughts, and emotion. They're like, gangs do that, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, yeah. And um, for them, I don't know. Uh, have you had much experience with gang members? Because it does seem to me like there's a lot of overlap with destructive Definitely. cultism. Definitely. It's the same thing that, you know, you find vulnerable people, you give them a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose and significance. And then you indoctrinate them into your belief system. What we're finding is we're um, looking at our, we now have 50 white supremacist interviews. And uh, you probably know that white supremacists, their main enemy are Jews. They uh, feel that whites are above everyone else and um, elite and that the rest of the people are mud people and should serve them or should be segregated into other places and that the Jews are the ones um, organizing everything that goes wrong in their lives and want to raise up minorities to be equal or above white. So then there's this claim of white genocide and white replacement. Yes. But it's very interesting how you can direct hate. So we've been looking at this process of directing hate, uh, particularly towards the Jews, and that it comes with this idea of elitism and that you have joined a group based on your skin color and your heritage that you now are someone special and you belong and you have significance but the cost of joining is that you have to hate and you have to engage in the behaviors that the group wants you to um, engage in and jews are your enemies and minorities are your enemies and, you know, it's terribly sad, but it's all about people with unmet needs. Well, there's the vulnerability of the influencee for sure, but then there's the organized predators or predatory organizations, the way I think about it, that are uh, imposing their own worldview, which is typically us versus them and good versus evil. We're good, they're evil and do, doing a very simplistic black and white version of what is history and what's reality. And a lot of these folks are going, you know, using things like the debunked uh, protocols of the elders of Zion, which was a, a, a Russian propaganda document, I believe, originally, or, mm -hmm. or Hitler's, you know, uh, the, you know, calling uh, Jews all kinds of names and blaming them for all the problems of the world and uh and so this this ideology is on the on the increase on the resurgence um and being jewish myself it's of great concern obviously of course it is uh, but we also uh, have christian identity in the states and yes. they're claiming that jews are not even people and minorities are not even human beings and um, and that they're the seed of Satan. Yes. And uh, there's the Turner Diaries, which is more the modern day version of blaming the Jews. Which was a novel by was that Turner or is that who was that who wrote that? Mm, uh, no, it's Turner. not Turner. It's, but I'm sorry, Pierce? I don't remember. Maybe. Pierce. Yeah, sounds right. And um, yeah, so this whole um, uh, information warfare situation that we're in right now online um, is making people stirred up feeling very outraged you know and pointing people to you know unfortunately uh, things like we need to take up arms and we need to overthrow the government because it's been taken over by the Jews and etc. Well that the interesting thing with white supremacists, we got one interview that I thought was so interesting. It was a young woman mm -hmm. and she was um, a single mom. And she said she woke up one day and she realized there wasn't a minority that had ever taken a job away from her or gotten a job instead of her. And she said, you know, I realized the reason I can't make a living is because the big corporations don't pay a living wage. She's working at Walmart or someplace like that. Mm -hmm. And 
that it's not about turning me against other minorities or minorities against me. We all need to be looking at these people that are profiting and want us to be distracted by our arguments between each other. And I thought it was so great. We made a counter narrative video of her. She's very convincing. And, you know, in the beginning of her counter narrative, she talks about why she fell into white supremacism. I think she had a bad experience with the minority. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I just thought she had it right on the head that some of the elites don't want us to think about the real, the real things that are going on. They just want us to be distracted and fighting each other. And that's so sad. Yes, indeed. And in my research, uh, there are bad actors, I wrote about this in the Cult of Trump book, um, that have been at it for decades to want to impose, you know, uh, a religious uh, uh, control of our government and break down the separation of church and state. They want to take away women's rights and revert back to the male centric, you know, model. And they want to undermine gay rights as well because it, it offends their sensibilities or their ideologies and such. Um, and a friend of mine, Arno Michaelis, who is a white supremacist, he had a band even now he was recruiting. Arno's um, from my home state. I always yeah. say we're both cheeseheads. Yes, we're from Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah, mm -hmm. and but in his story, he he started to realize living in hate really stinks, and he talked about working at a job that was actually uh, owned by a Jew and how he the the owner saw he didn't have any food for lunch and offered him half a sandwich you know which was really dissonant because you know he should hate his boss and the boss should be mean to him etc and um it really were these kinds of positive experiences um with real people that creates that dissonance between a person's you know conscience and and authentic self what i call authentic self versus their indoctrinated cult identity and that's ideology. a really really important point and i think so many times we can feel powerless especially when we think if there's big actors involved and they want us distracted and they want low-income people to be hating each other mm -hmm. that each one of us is out in the world and we have a possibility to challenge people's taught worldviews and directed hate. And when we run into these people with tattoos and piercings and, you know, kind of hateful looks, we can really shake them to their core. And that we found that over and over again in our sample that the way people got out of white supremacism is oftentimes they had an exposure that just totally invalidated the ideology that they'd been taught. So they were a truck driver and they were unloading their truck far away from their group. So they felt a little bit uh, more inclined to talk to the black guy that was also unloading with them every time. Or like you said, they got a sandwich from the Jewish guy and over time, they started to say, wait a minute, you know, the, the, what I've been taught just simply isn't true. Yep. But they still have these needs for purpose, for significance, for belonging. And if we uh, close them out, they have no chance. Exactly. And that's been my, my messaging for 45 years since my own deprogramming from the Moonies is like, stop being mean. To cult members it just reinforces their indoctrination when people called me names as a mooney threw beer cans at me cursed me spit at me it just made me feel persecuted and confirmed that i was doing god's will and that i was being you know a martyr for god to save the world but i tell the story i was out fundraising for the moonies in a hot summer day and this man said, you look very hot. Are you thirsty? Can I buy you a drink? And it created dissonance in my head because he's satanic. He should be mean. But I was thirsty. It was hot. 
and I rationalized this would be good for the cause to allow you know a satanic person to help a godly person to buy a drink and so I went inside with him he bought me I you know I was a social soda pop I don't even remember if it was a orange soda or whatever is what comes into my memory bank at this point but then he said to me I wonder when was the last time you talked to your mom and oh I said my. oh it's been a while and literally and he said come over here and I walked with him and I think it was a dime at the time <laughs> he put a dime in a payphone which is no longer exists and he said, dial your number and just say hi to your mom. I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. And I did it. And I talked with her. What a great and guy. Wow. It didn't help me at that moment to get out of the cult, but it planted a seed that never left. And after my deprogramming, I still remember this story mm -hmm. 45 plus years later, an uh, act of kindness and warmth and simple generosity. simple acts of kindness and that's what we just put in this paper about directed hate that of course you have to come at this from very many different ways as you well know yep. to try to get people out of this mindset but one of the things that you can use is positive exposures and in the case of directed hate towards jews most white supremacists have never met a jew so, you know, they have no idea if Jews have horns, you know, if they have black faces, uh, they just don't know. And it's very uh, confrontational for them to be invited to a Jewish home or to a synagogue and find out, oh, some of these people voted for Trump. And, uh, you know, or some of these people are extremely conservative. They're not all libtards, uh, you know, according to their thinking. Yes. And it's just wonderful, you know, that we're all human beings and simple, you know, it doesn't have to be invite them home. It doesn't have to be invite them to your place of worship. It can be buying them a soda and, uh, and just yeah. an act of kindness. I think Arno said um, uh, he would routinely buy a meal at McDonald's or someplace like that. And there was a black woman. And every time when he paid, he had tattoos on his hand that he know he noticed that she was always looking at and he felt shame, but she kept being loving and kind and accepting and not recoiling from him. And that really got through to him. Yes. So, you know, think she wasn't a, a licensed psychologist. She wasn't spending an hour with him a week. She was just being a human being and we can all do that. Yeah, a thousand percent. So right now, the world has never been more polarized. There's so much disinformation that's being put out on the internet. People are spending so much time on screens. I thought it was very interesting that you said in your study that 20% of the people recruited into ISIS were recruited online. My sense is, especially in the last two years with COVID, is most people are being recruited online now into a whole variety of destructive authoritarian groups. I think so too. The, the white supremacists told us that a lot of them had been in earlier that talked to us and they said, you know, we were back on the message boards and this and that. And they said how things just exploded with the internet because suddenly you could order books you know maybe you couldn't buy it at your bookstore or if you were over in germany it was banned but you know now suddenly you could click 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 and there it was click 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 you can find other people that agree with you and my personal theory of um terrorism i call it the lethal cocktail of terrorism is that you need a group you need an ideology you need social support for both of those. And then you need a person with vulnerabilities and motivations. And nowadays, if that person with vulnerabilities and motivations gets on the internet and is either seeking you out or finds you just when they're vulnerable, immediately uh, a group can coalesce around them and give them social support and start feeding them this ideology and telling them to narrow their focus you know, don't don't read mainline news anymore because it's just lies. Um, go to this mosque or go to this group, and they can, uh, as you like to say, exert undue influence over them very quickly. So we see quick radicalization trajectories, although strong ones. 
Yes. And it's the power of the internet and it's the power of things like this. I mean, we're talking to each other. I'm watching your facial expressions. Um, you know, I'm watching you nod and yeah, that wasn't possible um, some years ago. You know, right. we would have had to get together face to face and I would have had to travel to Boston or you would have had to come down to DC. Yes. But now I can sit with somebody that's over in Syria or in Germany or Denmark and they can be giving me all this feedback and telling me, you know, you're, you're doing the will of God. And, yes. and we know that people, I mean, the, the other thing that we have to acknowledge to ourselves, and I was so happy when the Me Too movement came along, because I think anybody that's a good clinician these days has to admit how different our society would be if we admitted how much child abuse actually happens yes. and how many adults are walking around with hidden stories inside that are um, uh, triggered whenever they have post-traumatic recall. So they run into reminders. And then we see groups like QAnon that can just play on that yes. and tell them, you know, the abused children. And immediately they fall in line because that's them. And they've never gotten any treatment. Um, they're right. terrified for anybody that would go through what they went through. They're willing to uh, travel across states and carry a gun to stop Pizzagate, even though yes. it's not even true. Yes. And, and it wasn't just women who were sexually assaulted. Boys were too. Yes. Whether it's by priests or by other authority figures. So and we don't, we don't acknowledge the truth of that. And finally, in the Me Too movement, we started to say that at least women, that there were a lot. And I, I remember when everyone was posting on Twitter and I said, geez, which of 20 incidences should I post about? Because, you know, we all have them of, you right. know, people that have touched us inappropriately, thing, people that have said things and, you know, for some of us, rape and molestation. But there's so many wounded people walking around in our societies and we need good trauma informed care. And this is one of the things that could prevent so much crime and so much going into cults, gangs and terrorism. Well, you now you're touching on the whole need for mental health as a priority, as a public health crisis. Well, and also mental health that is trauma informed, that is right systems oriented that is thoughtful and that doesn't blame you that right. you can't function if you were raped molested uh, uh a victim of a abusive home an alcoholic home a chaotic home and hand you a bottle of pills because yes. you know we can look at what the statistics are i think it's way over 20 percent of americans are taking prozac mm -hmm. and you know if you add all the pills together that americans are taking we want these quick fixes to mental health and they don't they don't work they just mask the problem and what makes people, a lot of money for the pharmaceutical industry yes and what people really need is acknowledgement of yes you grew up in an abusive home and first of all they need for these homes to uh, be addressed way back in school and you know when you go to the doctor and you come in with bruises and but anybody that's grown up in a horrible home or was abused at their place of worship or other right. things like that is very likely to go into dissociative states easily yes and anybody that's trying to recruit for any of these groups knows how to take advantage of those dissociative states I, we totally agree with each other i would like to add corporal punishment as a trauma experience that's been kind of socially acceptable because the bible says you know spare the rod and spoil the child and so so countless people are raised where they're being with belts with paddles you know uh hit for being children or for fidgeting or for not obeying mommy and daddy and whatever they believe a hundred percent. So I think that, you know, when people ask me, what's the, why is American, why are Americans so violent? Uh, corporal punishment is a piece of it along with the glorification of guns and definitely. And we, and, you know, even draw a line and say, um, uh, 
violence in the home, you know, people that, you know, lightly spank their kids and um, try to guide their kids. I, I, I don't think you ever have to hit a kid ever, but I can understand people that are just dedicated to that. But that's very different than all of these children that grow up with sheer terror of their parents. Their parents are out of control, screaming at them, hitting them, hitting them hard, you right. know, banging them across the room, banging them into the wall, slapping right. them in the face. And this isn't something that any of us should support. Exactly. And I'll add one more issue, which is if the parents uh, divorce, one the one parent, the custodial parent, might actually attempt to brainwash the children to hate the other parent because of their own anger towards the other, you know, to their former partner. And so there's a lot of not just cutting off from that person, but their whole family, um, you know, mom or dad's, you know, parents and siblings and cousins. Well, we sure found when we went after the um, sample that's 50 right now of white supremacists. Um, a lot of what are called the ACEs, the adverse uh, child experiences. Yes. And I learned to no longer ask in my interview um, to assume that their mom and dad were married. So, you know, when were you born? Um, did your mom and dad live together at the time? Uh -huh. uh, did they get married before or after you were born or ever? And because so many of them didn't know who their fathers were, or there were these violent episodes that ended up in a divorce, and then in some cases, manipulations like you're talking about. Yes. But broken homes are painful experiences for children and create vulnerabilities. But particularly if the either either and both parents uh, don't continue to function. And we talked to a lot of white supremacists that their parents were on drugs and uh, violent and sure. just not functioning at all. Yep. So we're our time is speeding by. I, I want to come back, if I may, just to your incredible research and access to to people's stories who have been radicalized and in many cases de-radicalized and your statement earlier that sure I could develop a program for a country to help you know with people who've been incarcerated and you mentioned also that you helped with an expert witness on behalf of a woman and I believe in in the Netherlands uh, uh, was that on Zoom, by the way, or on video, or did you have to fly there to testify? As an this expert? particular one was Norway. I've Norway. done Norway, Sweden, and I'm so about you... to do one in Ireland. So there are returnees that are being um, prosecuted for their time in ISIS, and usually I'm asked, I've worked for the prosecution and I've worked for the defense of what were the roles of women in ISIS based yep. on our research. And, so did um, you have to go in person? I'm just I did curious. go in person for this one. The okay. first time around, I did it by um, Zoom. And then okay. I think they called something akin to a mistrial in her case. Mm -hmm. So it was being retried and I, I went in person and I'm glad I did. Good. So I'm so thrilled that you are doing the work that you're doing, that Georgetown has given you a position, you know, as, as in the Department of Medicine. It's wonderful. Talk, as we wrap up, talk about the research and the resources that you wish you had um, to, you know, for 2022 and what we need okay. going forward. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that everything we do, our model of how we do our work is we hope to get a funder that helps us um, to do our work. And in this case, we've had State Department, UN Women, EU Commission, and particularly the state of Qatar support us. And that means that everything we do, we give away for free. Okay. So if you go to the ICSVE website, and maybe you can list it with this, um, you can go to events and you can uh, look at 25 of our trainings. They're an hour and a half long. You've given two of them and we really <laughs> appreciate you for Thank that. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, we got such good feedback. 
And uh, I just heard from somebody today that said that last guest, he was just amazing. Mm, And uh, how much they learned from you. But um, so we record everything and we put those out. Um, Everything we write from our interviews, uh, we code all of our data on over 250 uh, variables. Mm -hmm. And then we go through it. We look at military and white supremacism, for instance, or we look at gender, or we look at this uh, concept of directed hate, or we look at spontaneous de-radicalization. So if you go to our website, you can look at publications and you can read to your heart's content. Everything Mm -hmm. there is for free. You don't have to pay anything to read it. And you can also go to our ICSVE YouTube channel, And you can look at our counter narratives. I think we have 25 of white supremacists and we have 250 of um, uh, ISIS and Mm Al-Shabaab. And Facebook has helped us to distribute those all over the world in campaigns. Mm -hmm. We also have publications where we study the effect of them and we find that they are effective. And uh, as far as support, we'd love more donors. So you know, contact me. You can put my email if you want. Contact sure. me and. Uh, oh, we'll uh, definitely promote this heavily. I thank mean, you. Well, I, we'd I, love I, more supporters and we love private donors because they're not so bureaucratic. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where it's just been really lovely working with the embassy of Qatar because they've just really let us go. And we just, you know, made it possible that we could interview 273 ISIS members. And that was quite a blessing Mm -hmm. great so um in your final wrap-up anything else you'd like to say that we haven't covered i think i would just uh reinforce that everybody has a role to play so you know you you can be somebody advocating for prisons to actually have rehabilitation Uh, You can be advocating for prevention in your schools, that there's a module in your schools where kids are taught these things. Uh, You can yourself promote things on Facebook. You can promote any of our uh, videos that you'd like to. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is be a kind person, be a loving person, because, you know, especially if you see that guy with tattoos, um, you know, maybe he really wants to take those tattoos off and erase, erase the hate on his body, which is something that, um, T.M. Garrett from our center uh, helps a lot of people to do. Yeah, Maybe he, he wants to Ku- re-enter. Ku Klux Klan. Sorry to he was former Ku Klux Klan, yeah. but um, he's out for 20 years and a heart of gold. Yep. And, uh, you know, here's somebody again, you know, that he just needed a chance. And uh, we're so proud to work with him. So I, I, I love your work and continued success. I do want to just add one more to what you just said, which is if you're a former cult member or you were involved with an authoritarian religious group or political group or whatever, and you've left, but you've been ashamed to tell anybody or because you feel like there's a stigma out there in the public, I'm encouraging people to be part of a new hashtag movement called I Got Out that oh, me and friends, wonderful. Uh, it's in the spirit of me too, hashtag me too. Yep. Mm-hmm. I got out. I was in the Moonies. I got out. Very life, good. life is good. And so the more people can, can, can educate and people in their family, their friends, their work settings on social media of, let me tell you my story of how I got co-opted by- And those are powerful. Artist. Those are powerful. Yep. Yeah. So thank you so much for You're your You're welcome. Work. Thank you for having me. And we'll Let's stay in touch. Soon. Thank you so